Let the word go The forward. challenge, the opportunity to connect. The 1960s, a time of imagination and change, a time of anger and fear. The 1960s is a pioneering program called Challenge. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. That looked at our connections, our divisions, through the lens of shared values. Sixty years later, we examine our divisions, our connections, our shared pains and successes in a new program called Challenge 2.0. The textbook definition of history is that it's a discussion of the human past as described by written documents left by humans. But when such history is uncomfortable, inconvenient, or even just controversial, some groups seek to erase it. That's particularly true of black history today. One example is the state of Florida's Stop Woke Law that seeks to limit educators and students from discussing issues related to race and gender. And such efforts are spreading beyond the state of Florida. In this episode of Challenge 2.0, then, we speak with two veteran black educators about the histories white nationalists are seeking to silence. We are very fortunate on this program to be welcoming two eminent guests who have a great deal of experience in this topic. And also, I must note that this is the first time on Challenge 2.0 we've had two siblings uh, on the program, but we couldn't have... Uh, uh, been fortunate enough to have two better guests on this. So I would like to introduce at this time, Jean Cash, who has been a teacher and a principal and also a coach, and Dr. Kreiner Cash, who has served as a superintendent of schools in a number of major communities and has been involved in a lot of educational reform efforts. So I thank both of you for joining us in this program. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Well, I would start with a question that goes back, I think, in uh, your backgrounds quite a bit. When you take on an effort to oppose people who are trying to rewrite or suppress history, uh, that requires courage, conviction, and uh, a great deal of background. And I'm guessing that did not come out of a vacuum, that there was someone or something that was of great influence to both of you. Uh, who or what was that? Well, with me, and probably with Krina also, my granddad and dad, you know, really influenced me when I was growing up. My granddad was a hard worker. He was the head butler in Charleston, West Virginia. And his wife, my grandmother, was the head cook for 16 years. And so when he got enough money, he was able to get eight acres in Kentucky, where he grew tobacco, built his own house, which was two stories up on a hill himself with a little help. But he was very talented. And he paid everything in cash. He was able to send my dad to an historical black college, Howard University. And then he able to get his doctors later on at Purdue in clinical psychiatry. But they really influenced me because of their work ethic. You know, my granddad didn't have a degree, but he was a hard worker into his 80s. I remember going to the Capitol with him after he was way down working permanently and I would walk around the Capitol in elementary school and he would do some things in Charleston, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. My dad always had books. You know, he was always progression. His theme was continuous learning. And I learned that from him that just because you might have a degree that just opened some doors that might not have been open, but your whole life is continuous open. Uh, my dad and I'll make this real short, was the first African-American I saw on TV that wasn't an athlete or wasn't a singer. Mm -hmm. And they asked him, on, I'll still remember this, It was, I think it was 1954, 1955, before, quote, unquote, they call it the Civil Rights Movement, but that started a long time ago. They asked him a question, what do you want? And he made it real simple. What do you want? You want good housing? You want a good school? You want a decent job? And he said, it's not that difficult. Whatever you want, I want. And, and that influenced me all of my life on, on that issue. So those were the two main people that influenced me, my dad, my granddad. Reiner? Well, I certainly uh, would concur with several of those folks uh, that Gene talked about. Uh, he did say that our grandparents were a butler and a cook in West Charleston, West Virginia. 
but I know what he wanted to add, and I will do it now, is that they served together for over 60 years four governors of West Virginia in White Sulphur Springs in the Greenbrier uh, governor's mansion. Mm. So that, that was a significant uh, length of time to serve in that capacity. And they always worked as a team. And so we learned that early about if you're with your spouse, you work as a team, your partners, and you achieve together, you do things together. Well, certainly my father and my mother, my grandparents, my wife, Lisa, my first wife who passed away in 2011, um, but she was an influence in her family, um, several professors in higher education, several great teachers in pre-K to 12 education. And then I've got to say my, my favorite heroine of all time, Harriet Tubman, uh, taught me to, to be patient, but to also be urgent about change and about doing what's right, uh, particularly for your, for your people. Her, fa her quote that I always quoted with my teams uh, in my professional career was, uh, I freed thousands of slaves, but I could have freed thousands more if only they knew they were slaves. Mm. So that speaks to that whole issue of mindset and how effective some of the institutions, uh, slavery and uh, other uh, systems designed to keep Black people's mind uh, oppressed uh, and enslaved long after the chains were taken off. So I think those folks uh, were very influential to me. Gene mentioned HBCU, the HBCU colleges and universities, historically black colleges and university are very strong in tradition in our family, uh, particularly my, my wife's family and my family. Uh, so my father went to Howard University, had outstanding education there. My wife, Lisa, went to Howard University, outstanding education there. So historically black colleges were strong in their influence throughout our growing up. And so we always saw black people who achieved and, and who, who succeeded academically. Scholarship was important and going on to college and graduate school was sort of a non-negotiable for all of us uh, growing up. As we look at the efforts, and one of the most uh, cited examples is Florida's stop woke law, but when we see examples anywhere in the country to either eliminate black history, knowledge of black history, uh, or to rewrite it, uh, there's certainly the intellectual response to that, but there also has to be sort of that visceral response. What's your initial reaction when you hear about something like that? This issue of suppressing uh, erasing our history was always going on. It was occurring for hundreds of years mm -hmm. and for millennia even. So this recent culture war effort, uh, fairly weak actually, uh, dangerous, but it's weak, mm -hmm. um, is is just another aim to try to do that uh, with, with our history. So my reaction is always stay prepared, stay ready, so you don't have to get ready. And uh, continue to educate yourself about what is truth mm -hmm. and be a teacher. Be a teacher. No matter what role in this world you you are in, you can be a teacher. But you first have to educate yourself and become knowledgeable uh, yourself. Uh, this is not new, but in order for us to take our unique and noble place in the history of human civilization, Mm -hmm. uh, we have to continue to educate and teach others. And that drove me throughout my career to make sure that other children, other people uh, could grow into uh, what I call one world, one people. Mm -hmm. Lots of different cultures, lots of different histories, but there's no reason we can't all be one world, one people appreciating and learning and enjoying what we learn about other cultures and peoples. One of the things I noticed, especially as a leader in schools, was what was in the library? What was available? What were the resources to kids? And I found out that 
They might have a couple black athletes books about them, but no substance. I'm not saying that wasn't important to learn about them because they did sacrifice. But when I looked at the books on the shelf, I would go to the superintendent and said, you have to give me fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. And he would say, for what? And I would say, I'm going to purge your library, my library. <laughs> he said, what? <laughs> he said, I'm going to purge it. And, and, and these are the books. Whether you're Asian, indigenous, African-American, they need to see themselves when they walk in there. Mm -hmm. Display the books. Take them off the shelves so they can see themselves. When you look at the threat that's coming today, I mean, the threat's been there. I mean, in the book club read 1619. Mm -hmm. You know, that we've had in other things like that. I looked at James Baldwin's book here. This one is called um, Nothing Personal. And he talks about that. And it's always been there. So we just have to get out of our seats again, even though I'm in my ninth um, decade. And, and keep continuing to try to improve on what certain groups of people are trying to do in certain state legislatures. And that's why I go down to the, for years, I've been going to the state legislature and asking them, what are they doing to help those who look differently? What about housing? And we'll get into that later. But it's important to be awake. I don't like to say that all the time, but we have to be continuous. Like Kreiner had said, it's a lifelong process. And it's some improvement, but it's it's got to be more. Let's tap into your experience as educators, uh, to which you've dedicated your lives. As you see some of these efforts, uh, as you've seen the lack of resources that you mentioned, Gene, on the bookshelves, what cost have you seen that uh, levy on the lives of the students that you've come in touch with? And what can a change? What uh, can a change in having more of those resources available also have? on students and young people? Well, I believe that um, people of color, when you look at the resources, when I came up over 30 years ago to the Lake Washington School District, it's probably the number one, it has the number one high school in the state, the STEM school in Tulsa. And, and it has within 10 miles of my house, um, seven of the top schools in the state. So that means that as an African-American, if I live close to those schools, the equity will always go up mm -hmm. in my house because of the schools and, and the community around it. But I think what has happened is that even in with some African-Americans and a lot do not know our history and reading, reading, reading is, is so important. Mm -hmm. When I was an educator, of course, you don't want someone in your school who's gonna be real disruptive to 99% of the students and in danger. So that person has to go, I don't care, you know. But what I would do instead of sending somebody home, I would have them come to my office. I would have African-American history in my office and they would have to read for two days with me and then give me a synopsis of what they learned instead of just sending them home. And um, when you go to homes of, of um, say poorer students and you walk into the homes, there's no books on the shelves, mm -hmm. you know? And as an educator, why I work so hard is seven out of 10 African-American males who do not have a degree, high school degree, are in jail or have been in jail, seven out of 10. So that's why I stayed in education to help improve that number, one of the numbers. Ryder, what have you seen? What we learned is that the home curriculum was the most important curriculum of all the curriculum. Interesting. And that when, if you want to learn Black history, my father used to say, I don't want you to learn it at school. I want you to learn it at home because mm -hmm. I'm going to teach you what your history is. And then I'm going to expose you to books, to music, to the arts, to science, to mathematics, to literature, to politics, to all of the areas that Black people through the ages, extending back to way back into pre-colonial uh, Africa, uh, have accomplished as individuals and as people and as groups and so forth. So, so we were immersed in a home curriculum of Black history because of, as I said, the tradition 
uh, that our parents came from, particularly my father and our grandfather. He didn't believe in television. He saw no value in television whatsoever. So we did not have television growing up. We had books. We saw people come into our home on a regular basis that were professionals. Gene knows this. They were doctors, they were lawyers, they were sociologists, they were professors in higher education. They were accomplished musicians, accomplished in all kinds of fields. My father, a professional psychologist and a professor for years and years and years. And he would do sensitivity training groups where people would come in, couples or individuals, mm -hmm. always coming into our home for to talk about hot button topics going on in the in the uh, community or in this nation. And I would sit on the steps and try to hide and not be seen, but I certainly was listening. And man, were those some powerful conversations. And yeah. my father was sort of the mediator, made sure they didn't get too crazy because sometimes tempers would flare around topics that we that they talked about from you know, marriage to race to politics, any issues on that. And to see that, among some of the most accomplished people in our community, and they also happen to be black. That's what you have to imbue our young people with. And so mm -hmm. that motivated me. And by the way, my sister, oldest sister, Resna, one step down from Jean, she had a magnificent collection of jazz artists, records, albums, the old, you know, wax 33s. And she would, I remember sitting sprawled on the living room floor, just listening to her teach me about Thelonious Monk, or Nat Adderley, Cannonball Adderley, Art Blakely, you know, uh, Duke Ellington, Count Basie. Mm. And this is important. I'm going to bring it all together. My father had each of us learn a instrument. We had to play an instrument. And my instrument was piano. My father played the violin. And Gene, you know this, because he played at 3 a.m. in the morning sometimes. <laughs> but he was outstanding. He could play Tchaikovsky's Concerto in D. He could play tunes like, he sound like Ishtar Perlman, to be honest with you. And if you didn't know, you didn't know. And he wasn't, of course, as accomplished as them. But he had learned since high school to, to play the violin. And he owned a Stradivarius violin. So we had a Steinway piano and a Stradivarius violin in our home growing up. And so when you have music all around, no television, books all around, you're learning and you become imbued and inculcated in rich, rich academic uh, achievement and uh, accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And so my career, I was trying to recreate those kinds of environments for my kids because I knew these were alterable variables. It was not about you are not able to learn at a mm -hmm. high level. You're black. So therefore, you really don't uh, we don't expect that much uh, of you uh, and we don't expect you to learn at the very, very highest levels uh, of our society and, and in history. And, and so that expectation was never even on the table, but I wanted to bring that. And where I did make some headway into transforming mm -hmm. large districts like Memphis City Public Schools, one of the poorest districts in, in, in the country in terms of poverty level and socioeconomic income. Buffalo Public Schools, one of the poorest cities and districts in the country in terms of poverty and educational, uh, social educa social economic background. I said, no, that doesn't have to be a constant state. This mm -hmm. doesn't have to be a foregone conclusion. And so I started bringing into the curriculum and into Saturday programs and into what I call community schools, opportunities for children to learn chess, early age, to play music in the violin, early age, to learn Japanese, Chinese, in other complex world languages, Russian, at an early age, for fourth grade and, and so forth and, and, and on. And those are just some of the things that we were doing in, as a career uh, in order to try to 
uh, lift our people in a very, very continuous way and uh, and not make it piecemeal and haphazard and random. I think an important question is how we got here. And by that, I mean, we hear about uh, the Black experience in America from the slavery era onward, but it extends so much farther in the background in terms of the rich history of Africa. I'm wondering if you can give us a quick overview of exactly what uh, civilization was like in Africa long before slavery was developed and began to oppress that continent. Um, I've gone to Africa and supported in northern Ghana, um, 35 wells in different villages. And when you look at countries like Ghana, where the gold was taken out by the Europeans, where the slavery, you know, were um, captured and just put right on ships in, in little holes back there, all, all the resources that they could find from the different quote unquote white cultures was taken out as much as they could. Mm-hmm. And so as I go to these villages, it's 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 amazing. You have Christians and Muslims living in some of the same villages in Ghana. You know, the antagonism because they're surviving. And the women that I see for centuries have been walking so often to get decent water and to survive and, and not get an education. But now because of these wells and other sources, if you look at it, they're, they're able to support their family better with better food, with healthy food. And if you look at, um, I remember one time I was in a museum with Krina and they were talking about Africa in one sense and then Egypt in another sense. You know, like the black pharaohs, the queens who were black, they were ignored and it's all one. You know, the culture was all one. It's, it's, it's just amazing how that's been ignored and what the Dutch did, what the Portuguese did. And so they want to keep that out of our history, out of their history of, of, of what happened. And it's it's so much history there. And it brings tears to your eyes when you see how different cultures and kingdoms were destroyed because of wanting to be rich by the slavery in America. Mm-hmm. There have been throughout history, and fortunately, when I was a young student at Princeton University in the under, as an undergraduate, I dedicated my senior thesis, senior thesis. You always had, you had to write a thesis to, to graduate from Princeton. And I was determined to fight against all of the sort of whitewashed curriculum that I had been exposed to. Even though I went to some of the great high schools and colleges and universities in the world, you have to actually in, be intentional about trying to find your place mm-hmm. in, in, in the curriculum and in, and in history. But there have always been what I call some rascal, mostly African-American male and female scholars who've dedicated their lives to researching about the origins of African civilization and culture. Mm-hmm. And when you go to those scholars, Very, very good number of them that I've researched deeply, and I titled and wrote my thesis, as I said. But here are some of them. So John Henry Clark, Joseph Ben Yocanan, Chancellor Williams, Ivan Van Sertema, Shauna Maglin Bayan. Also, you have the uh, people who have written today more closely associated uh, mm-hmm. is Henry Louis Gates, as you said. And then, of course, Sheikh Anchadat was one that I refer to, a great Senegalese scholar and researcher. But their basic theme, the basic tenet out of all of this great work, that Africa was the cradle of civilization. It was the first civilization. And the people were Black. The people had woolly hair, they had dark skin, and they were creating and developing great cities, great architecture, art and architecture like you've never seen before at the time. Egypt, for example, is a black civilization, not Mm -hmm. a remade white civilization, which is what you learn in school. 
There's no trace or evidence that anything in Egypt had anything to do with black, but it did. And there were many civilizations where and tribes below uh, sub-Saharan Africa, Kim, Kush, Mali, Songhai, great mm -hmm. uh, civilizations that developed art, writing, advances in music, advances in mathematics, science, engineering, to be able to build these temples and all of this uh, masterworks that you see in the pyramids and, and, and so forth. This, this is history that is carefully and meticulously documented mm -hmm. over thousands of years. And these were black cultures, kings, queens, pharaohs, and so forth. And so it's very important just to have that sense that we come from nobility, that we come from greatness, that we come from uh, people who did have a cultural identity, who did have family and ancestral pride. We can tell that we've just essentially opened the doors to a new library, perhaps for some of our viewers and listeners. And so what I'd like to do is, uh, number one, say thank you for this part of the conversation. And thank you for sticking with us so we can pick up more or less where we've left off in the next episode of Challenge 2.0. And so I thank uh, Kreiner and I thank Gene and I thank each of you for tuning in. And tune in again next week as we pick up the next part of this conversation. Thank you very much.